Hi and welcome to another episode of This is Australia. Now this episode, it's actually one of those episodes that I really love because it's all about Australia and for me this is Australia. Now we're gonna look at some stories up here in this beautiful town called Windsor but I think that we're gonna have to change the name now because we're gonna cover a story that you wouldn't believe and we're gonna call it Utopia. No more Windsor, forget it. The politicians of New South Wales decided that this place is got to be called Utopia from now on. I'll explain to you in a minute. So Utopia, sorry, Windsor, yeah, that, that's the real name, Windsor. It's a historic town. This mill was built in 1834, but let's talk to some of the local people. We have with us now Peter, who is a local resident. He lives here in Windsor, and actually he just lives just across the road. And behind me, we have this amazing pub. Looks very old, Peter. Hi. G'day, Harry. How are you? Good, good. Yes, it's the oldest hotel in Australia. Dates from 1815. Um, it was built um, uh, under the direction of Governor Macquarie, who requested that a large building be used, uh, be constructed in the, in, the, in this square. It wouldn't just be somewhere in Sydney, the oldest not, one? Not anymore. They've all gone. Ori the original ones have gone. Yeah, so oh, this is the, right. oldest, the, old, the, the oldest existing pub in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's sitting in the oldest town square in Australia. So this is the oldest town square? It's the oldest town square, Thompson Square. Um, it dates from 1795. So what about that uh, the street over there? I can see a lot of beautiful old buildings there as well. Yeah, yeah, that's George Street. Um, it uh, again was named after after King George. Um, the oldest building in the square is uh, the Shipley Crozier building over there, which dates from 1813. Um, and this is also the oldest business precinct in Australia. Okay. It's been operating as a as a source as a, an area of business continuously since 1795. Um, okay. Sydney Cove is obviously older but it was built over. Parramatta was older by a couple of years but it, is, it has changed mm -hmm. um, and so this is the oldest commercial precinct in Australia, it's the oldest public square in Australia, okay. um, we've got the oldest pub in Australia. Um, the history here is, is absolutely irreplaceable and the town square itself is the most unique town square in the country. This is the first bridge that was made in the Hawkesbury River. It's the, it's the oldest crossing of the Hawkesbury River. Is it called the Windsor Bridge? Yeah, it's called the Windsor Bridge, yeah. Okay. It's built in 1874. So it was actually built before the Harbour Bridge? <laughs> oh yeah, built a long time before the Harbour Bridge. And it was, a, it was the first bridge to use cast iron caissons or piers because it was built to withstand the floods. Now, can I ask something? Back in those days, they actually looked um, at building a bridge like the Harbour Bridge and other bridges, built of course, another future. infrastructure yeah, yeah. for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, these days, Mm. I think that uh, the politicians they don't have the vision the no. old politicians well, in, have. In, in 1874, they built a two-lane bridge, you know, to, to deal with the traffic here. So with the donkeys and the horses and yeah, the carriages. Yeah, the horses and the carriages, and they built it. They built it strong to withstand the floods. Yeah. Um, that's why it can and still. Now it takes how many semi-trailers? Oh, uh, it takes trucks every day. Every day, over 2,200 a day. Every day. Every day, and over, over about 22,000 vehicles a day through here every right. day. Okay. We talked about the Harbour Bridge and how Premier Lang back then mm. cut the vision to build a bridge with eight lanes. Mm. And the railways. And the railways yeah. and a cycling lane. We have actually a pedestrian and a yeah, cycling yeah, lane. Yeah. And apparently, I, I don't know, I'll have to check on that, but there is a provision for a second deck underneath the bridge. Really? Now, back then, did, yes. what did they have back then? The, the, the T4? Uh, what did you Model call it? The Model T4. That's right. And yeah. probably a lot of donkeys, uh, sorry, horses. horses. Not, not yeah. so many donkeys, donkeys. back then, but yeah. we had a lot of horses and yeah. carriages, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. That was back then. Yeah. With the horses and the carriages. And now um, they made this thing called uh, Miles 5. I'd call it Miles 5. That's the average speed on the M5. <laughs> That's I was on there. Two on, lanes. I, I was on there on, on uh, I was there last Monday driving to the airport and it was just a, an absolute mess. Two lanes. Yeah. Today yeah. and yeah. back then, hundred years ago, they how many eight? Eight we, lanes. Eight lanes. Oh no. And now here, okay, they we've got this amazing bridge that is actually very old, very important, very historic, yes. and of course, it will probably stay here for another thousand years. Mm, could easily. Yeah. 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 There's bridges in Europe that are, you know. Are, 2,000 years old that's still in public use okay. and this was built to a higher standard so right. there's no reason why it shouldn't. Okay so now basically we've got 
These politicians, the M5 politicians, the M5 politicians, <laughs> right? Today's politicians, and what do they want to do, Peter? They want to knock down the old two-lane bridge and build a new two-lane bridge. How many lanes, sorry? Two Can lanes. you repeat that? Two lanes. <laughs> because the intersections are causing the, the traffic thing. So <laughs> sorry, mate, I just scaled myself. We need to bypass. This is a yeah. joke. It is, it is a joke. This it's is a, a, a joke. Bad, it's a $100 million bad joke. $100 million for this two-lane bridge. Mm, it is $100 million. And they want to demolish yeah. this historic bridge to build another one for $100 million. They're not Greek don't politicians. Know, know. They're Australians. We do well, things different here in Australia, I thought, you would, Peter. You, you would hope. We would hope we would do things differently and you, and you would hope that they would uh, you know protect our australian history and we're only a young country and um exactly. and we uh, you know a lot of the places in the rest of the world their history their old places have been built over many many times yep. um and here we've got the original okay so we have to why do, a bit of work. do we actually have to build a bridge here and i mean i think they say that they can't afford a bypass wait a second bypass is just your the other option that you just yeah, say just build, build build go around that go around yeah. the town like they do in every other town in this situation okay mm. now they've done it in any other towns well um they've done it all up and down the coast but um oh so know. they've done it in other other places oh yeah yeah they've done not it. as historic as windsor no, of course, no, of course not. but they don't really care about history yeah. that's politicians it, it um i have to agree with you there I have to agree okay. with you there. but, but there's even two this, of us then, but even, that we agree <laughs> maybe but, more but this is just an example of bad strategic planning they yeah. they want to develop on the other side of the river they want to you know do a lot of industry there there's going to be you know more housing development there's going to be industries such as sand mining and quarrying um, and they people are going to need to cross the river yeah so you you would think that they would go okay well let's build something out of town a bypass so all the industry can get quickly and efficiently to where it's got to go in yeah. Sydney yeah. Um, people who, who need to get into Sydney could drive on the bypass keep the old bridge for people who want to come into Windsor yep. it's already there needs a little bit of work to fix it up but it can be repaired quite economically and then put the money towards a bypass no they're going to knock down the one that works that's already there yep. and then replace it with basically the same thing how many letters have you sent to the premier in 2012 we handed in a petition to the legislative assembly that had nearly 13,000 signatures on it but what about this photo Oh, the photo, we've been getting people to sign a letter to the Premier. It's just okay. a pro forma. People yeah. sign it, have put their addresses. So these are all letters going to the Premier? Okay. Going to the Premier. Mountain. Yeah, the mountain. Okay. now it's, um, it's close to 20,000 letters. You know why I'm asking you? Why? Because I actually rang your local um, MP, the Liberal MP for New South Wales. I, I can't oh, pronounce... Mr. 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 Perrottet. Uh, it's a Perrottet. French name. I can't Dominic, remember. Dominic Perrottet. Yeah. yeah, that's him. Yeah. It's in there. That's him. Anyway. You know what they said to me? What? It's all lies. I asked for an interview and they said, no, you have to send us an email with the questions written. Huh? I beg your pardon? What are you scared of? Why didn't you want to come and talk to us on camera and tell us about this? Yeah. You want to demolish this historic bridge, this beautiful historic bridge, and you want to build another one that is two lanes over there instead of spending another 80, 000, 80 million to go on the other side. This is very un-Australian to me. It is, it is, it is un-Australian. I'm so proud to be Australian and things like this and make me very sad. Mm, I think I'm in a, in a third world country, really. And especially when you think that this is, uh, I mean, Australia, we pride ourselves on mateship, a fair go for people, and this is where it began. Yeah. This is where it began. Right. Where Governor, right. Governor Macquarie drew, right. drew a lot. Again, the historians say, you know, he in Thompson Square he signed a contract with the Australian people, and um, and uh, the historian Jan Barkley Jack, I think it's Jan, said that the very foundations of the Australian character are buried in the clay of Thompson Square. Now, the Gov New South Wales government wants to bulldoze that clay. Yeah. And we're saying, no, you're not going to do it. They admit that we need a bypass. So they know that that's yeah, the way to and go. They, and they know that they're going to have to build a bypass within the next 10 years. Right. Okay. So why not do it now? So basically... Save, save $100 million. Yeah, we spend $100 million. That's okay. We've got plenty. We spend $100 million now. And then maybe 10 years time, we'll spend another 180 Then we'll trash Australia's history in the meantime. <sighs> I'm trying to be very calm here. <laughs> I can see that. So do I. <laughs> yes. But... Peter, Thanks, Harry. Thank you very much. It's, it's, a, pleasure. Was, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, pleasure to meet you too. And um, just keep soldiering on. Well, yeah. I think that it's important yeah. Yeah. that. Uh, well, hopefully, you'll come out and see us again. Definitely. No, I'm just going to go outside. I'm going to just sit outside the office there, of the French named MP. I can't even say his name. 
and I'm gonna just stay there with the camera. I'm just gonna wait for him. I, I, I need an answer. I just need someone to tell me. It must be a logic on the other side. And I have to get both sides of the story. There is not one heritage expert or, or historian in Australia that supports this project and supports what they want to do. Okay. Because the RMS seems to be the all-knowing god of New South Wales at the moment. I'm here now at Thompson Square Occupation Centre. And I have with me Harry. He's one of the occupiers. Harry, hi. Hi, how are you, Harry? I'm very good. Tell me, how many days you've been here? On the 15th of April, this will be here a thousand days. A thousand days. Can you believe this? I think that's a record. We believe it is. Now, this is Australia. This is Australia for me. When you say a thousand days, you come here for eight hours every day and then you go home. Oh, no, no. We have two people here all the time, 24-7. You mean at every, night time as well? At night time, we do four-hour shifts. And what do you do in winter? Oh, we have a gas heater. And we keep warm, and we just enjoy being with other people. This makes me proud to be Australian, because this is what Australia is all about. We are fighting for our rights. But no one is listening, really, is it? The people are listening, but what about the politicians? The politicians and the roads and maritime services aren't but certainly the local people are. How many times the local MP has visited you here? None. I'm sorry, one. Oh, it was once before he became our member, when he was still uh, waiting for the election to come. <laughs> At election time? Yes, before election. <laughs> but isn't that typical politician? Yes, indeed. And for a, a Minister of Finance, he should be visiting us and finding out why we are so passionate about it. And at the time, he did say to the two ambassadors who were here, if the project's a good project, it was his job to find the money. So we're waiting for him to find the money. OK. Uh, we were talking before with Peter yes. about the Harbour Bridge yes. and how back then the pre Premier Lang had the vision yes. to build eight lanes yes. with the horses and carriages. Yes. What do you think about the politicians today? I think they're very short-sighted. Yeah. They're not looking for the future. That's why we're so passionate about our project here because we're arguing for good asset management and good planning for the future because that's what we're fighting for, a future for us, future for our children and uh, fighting for a future for everyone who uses the bridge. Peter, thank you very much. I really admire what you do. I have to buy myself a hat so I can take my hat off to you. And I don't know what to say. I got goosebumps just thinking what you guys have been through all these years, just because, just because the politicians, they don't listen to the people anymore. No, somehow or other, they just want to listen to the RMS and they don't want to listen to what we, who live here. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Harry. It's a privilege to know you. Our next story is very inspiring. Now, Athena Falidis is gonna bring us a story. It's about a friend of hers and it has to do with the Cancer Council. Let's have a look. Hi there, I'm Athena and I'm here today to tell you all about an amazing event, the Sydney Relay for Life. I became involved in this event as a team member to support my dear friend Cheryl Ayres, who's a four-time cancer survivor. Relay for Life is a fundraising event for Cancer Council where teams of people walk around the track for 24 hours. The idea being that cancer never sleeps, so neither do we. So we're here on the track where people are walking and running all day today, tonight and tomorrow and raising money for such a great cause. So we're going to ask them why they're actually relaying and who they're relaying for. Hi there. Hey, how are you going today? I'm good. Having a great day? Yeah. So who are you here for today? I'm raising money for my grandmother who passed away from ovarian cancer last January. Her name's Maria. Yeah. Sorry to hear that, Tom. Yeah, on my team, uh, we're actually called Maria's Warriors. Hey, guys! Hey! Hey! What are you guys up to? Just crawling. Crawling? That's pretty good. I've seen everybody else walking and running around here. So this is a new technique. Yeah, we just wanted to, like, challenge ourselves. Yeah. Mix it up a bit. <laughs> Fantastic. I think that's awesome. Why not? Let's try something different. How about I crawl with you? Let's do some crawling. Come on, let's do it. Oh, this is great. I don't know if I'm up for this though. I might be getting a bit old for this. All right, I'll see you guys on the other side. Bye. 
Um, I've been relaying for a few years now and um, in particular it's for all the friends of recent times that have come down with cancer, especially a recently a work colleague. So um, all of us in the office come together and uh, raise money. So we've done that for the last three years, I think. Well, you're here for a wonderful cause and um, I'm very proud of you and I'm sure everyone else is very proud of everyone here today. Um, this is a wonderful thing we're doing. We're here to represent Converging New South Wales. It's my work team um, and I've brought my family along because we have a lot of deaths in the family because of cancer. Um, my grandfather, my mum's sisters have all passed away from cancer and we're lucky enough that we have a survivor in the family, our auntie Nina, so yeah. <laughs> um, and also like it hit me hard of, I think last year when I'd lost a cousin to cancer, so here for her as well. We want to know about the baton. Who's going to tell us about the baton? Well, the maker has actually already left for the day, but um, we wanted to have something with Converger on it, so we used the bubble wrap from work. Yeah, we were recycling, so we thought we would use it and label it with where we're from. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's something to do in the way you can just pop it. <laughs> All right. And, and I think you were saying that you're going to wake up someone when they're falling asleep along the track? Yeah. Or someone that's going really slow because we're in the challenge, so whip them along. <laughs> so give them a whack, yeah? yeah? Okay. Have you, given, have you given any whacks today? No, not yet. <laughs> because I just started for the night till morning. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wonderful. <been> no. <laughs> She's been whacked, so. <laughs> oh, you've been naughty, have you? <laughs> well, have a wonderful day, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're here um, in honour of quite a few people. Uh, one of our recent franchisees, Coral Brett, Betts and uh, Debbie Cleaver and uh, in uh, hope of survivor for my husband Nikki um, and in memory of uh, quite a few family members. So it was great listening to everybody's stories on the track but my friend Cheryl is about to speak in the hope ceremony so let's go and have a listen to her. You know a cancer diagnosis absolutely lives up to its reputation and it is all you expect it to be. You hear those words I'm sorry, but the results are positive and it's cancer. And your heart doesn't just beat, it thumps in your chest. That cold shiver that goes up my spine and it settles in the pit of my stomach, I'm pretty sure all the colour drains away from my face as my brain starts to comprehend what my gut is telling it and the reaction of fear from my body. For me, that was always the same. You see, four times I've sat across from doctors and been told I And whilst the emotions are different each time, that gut reaction is always the same. What it shows me is just how much fear we place in the word alone. Have you ever wondered how you'd cope with a major change to your life, like an accident or a serious diagnosis like cancer? Well, I can tell you from experience, it's probably better than you think. I know you may find this hard to believe and you do hear it from a number of survivors, but I do feel lucky. Not, of course, from the disease, but from the lessons I've learned and the events surrounding it. You see, I was like you, blissfully ignorant of my lymph nodes and all that they do to clean my blood and clear infections out of my body. And then eight years ago, back in 2008, it all changed. And I found myself saying something I never thought I'd hear coming out of my own mouth. Yeah, I, I, I've got lymphoma. Um, doctors tell me I'm lucky though, um, because it's a good cancer to get, if you're able to choose things like that. I can only imagine that they refer to it as good because it has a good survival rate and surgery isn't required, and I did get it early. But when the doctor told me, all I could think, all I remember is saying, not me, I don't get cancer. Like, other, other people get cancer, not me. It, it was very surreal. So cancer certainly invokes fear and really too many other emotions to mention. But on the flip side, Surviving cancer comes from strength and love and zeal. And that's me. Like it was said, 
I feel I have a postdoctorate degree in surviving cancer. I'm not so much defined by the cancer that I had, but I am defined by surviving it. And as was said, I may have had cancer, but I don't think it ever had me. I also found I have a magic power, and that is to be able to turn most things into being a positive. My friends make me feel very loved, and they keep me filling up. <laughs> I've got a couple of friends who've been through the same journey, and I tell you their survivorship is also contagious. How fortunate I am to have these people in my life, and most newly, Vicky Connerty. We inspire each other to grow and to stay strong. But I won't kid you, cancer really sucks. It doesn't discriminate, it's cruel, and it's, in, it's unpredictable. Going on the journey, as they say, is arduous, but surviving it makes you appreciate life. And so I say to you that cancer can also make you feel loved and appreciated like never before. It will bring your family together. The adoration and admiration will overwhelm you. It'll help you to recalibrate what's really important in your life. You'll gather a new understanding of your body. You'll meet new people. People will say, you look great. Have you had work done? <laughs> you save on shampoo and hairdressing appointments. Sorry, Athena, that's our hairdresser. Um, you'll be challenged, but you'll be inspired and motivated and humbled. And I think, for me anyway, life gathered new meaning with peace and health, happiness and serenity at its core. So for me, there's also hope. And with hope, my amazing friends, my live long and prosperous, have gathered around me and shown me the love that you don't always get to feel in everyday life. It's truly awe-inspiring. <laughs> I'm genuinely grateful to this wonderful group of people who support me every day and have done an amazing job in fundraising and being here all day. Deep breath. We love you, Cheryl. <laughs> Don't make me cry. <laughs> And by now, I'm sure you'll also see why I admire the Cancer Council in their mission to create an Australia where cancer is no longer feared, but seen as a treatable and manageable disease. And with that, perhaps the greatest hope I've ever witnessed on this journey is the love and support shown by people just like you, that individuals and communities come together, raise funds, remember loved ones, but most importantly, you all feed the hope that we have in all of us to want a better future than we have today and one that is cancer free. Thank you. So if you would like to donate to this great cause, please visit the website below. Great work, everybody. See you next year. On three, everyone's gonna put their hands in the air. You're gonna wave them like you just don't care and scream. One, two, three, woo! Next week, oh my God, next week, we're gonna go to this place called Farmer's Markets down at Redfern. Now, this is my Australia. This is my Australia. I think that they have markets all over New South Wales, maybe all over Australia. We're gonna talk to some of the, the people there, but in order to sell the stuff in there, you have to produce it yourself. So that is guarantee, 100% made in Australia. There's some great stands there with some amazing food and great stuff there. So you should just go and visit every Saturday morning from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock down at Redfern. And this is the end of another show. Don't forget our websites, thisisaustralia.tv and metrorecusables.com.au. <laughs> After 10 episodes, I remember it. See you next week. <laughs>